Hey guys, welcome back to Enlightened Turtle. It's your host Kev here. Twelve kings that came to rule Egypt at the same time is an interesting tale, as is the legendary labyrinth of antiquity. However, both together is amazing and worthy of investigation. So here in this video, we will explore the writings of the ancient peoples and look at the stonework left behind. From labyrinths, tombs and excavations, to mummified birds. We shall go deep into antiquity in this video, so please subscribe, help the channel out, and without further ado, let's get straight into it. Reading through Herodotus's book, The Histories, I came across his references to an ancient underground structure of which 12 kings of ancient Egypt were entombed. The very notion of 12 pharaohs, a name later attributed to the Egyptian kings through the Bible, ruling at the same time, I found to be most intriguing, as Egypt I always thought had only one king, or maybe two, one for upper and one for lower Egypt, before the unification according to the mainstream. The chronology of Egypt is so that pharaohs have been laid out in a straight line when in fact multiple kings ruled at the same time but the chronology is not the focus of today and I have done other videos on this topic. Here follows a statement from the Greek philosopher Herodotus of Helicarnassus that was written around 450 BCE. Quote, Thus far went the records given by the Egyptians and their priests and they showed me that that from the time of the first king to that of the priest of Hephaestus, who was the last, covered 341 generations, and that in this time this also had been the number of their kings and of their high priests. Unquote. Herodotus mentions the priests of Hephaestus, who was the Greek god of fire, volcanoes, smithing and carpentry, he forged the weapons and armour of the gods, even making lightning bolts for his father Zeus, the Egyptian Amun. Hephaestus was rewarded for his works with the hand in marriage of Aphrodite, the goddess of love and the most beautiful goddess of them all. Here follows Herodotus's full commentary on the labyrinth. Quote, so far I have recorded what the Egyptians themselves say, I shall now relate what is recorded alike by Egyptians and foreigners, and shall add something of what I myself have seen. After the reign of the priest of Hephaestus, the Egyptians were made free. Egypt however had always had a king, so the people divided Egypt into twelve districts and set up twelve kings. These kings intermarried and agreed to be close friends no one deposing another or seeking to possess more than another. The reason for this agreement, which they scrupulously kept to, was this. No sooner were they established in their districts when an oracle gave a prophecy to them that whichever of them poured a libation from a bronze vessel in the temple of Hephaestus would be king of all Egypt. Moreover, they decided to preserve their memory of their names by a common memorial, and so they made a labyrinth a little way beyond Lake Maurice and near a place called the City of the Crocodiles or Crocodopolis, which I covered in a previous Herodotus video. I have seen it myself, and indeed words cannot describe it. If one were to collect the walls and evidence of all the other efforts of the Greeks, the sum would not amount to the labour and cost of this labyrinth. And yet the temple at Ephesus and the one at Samos are noteworthy. Though the pyramids beggar description, and each one of them is a match for many great monuments built by the Greeks, this labyrinth surpasses even the pyramids. It has twelve roofed courts with doors facing each other, six face north and six to the south in two continuous lines, all within one outer wall. There is also 
double sets of chambers, 3,000 altogether, 1,500 above ground, and the same number underground. We ourselves viewed those that are above ground and speak of what we have seen, but we learned through conversation about the underground chambers. The Egyptian caretakers would by no means show them to us, as they were, as they said, the burial vaults of the kings who first built this labyrinth and of the sacred crocodiles. Thus we can only speak of from hearsay of the lower chambers. The upper we saw ourselves, and they are creations greater than human. The exits of the chambers and the mazy passages, hither and thither, through the courts, and were an unending marvel to us. As we passed from court to apartment, and from apartment to colonnade, from colonnades again to more chambers, and then yet into more courts. Over all this is a roof made of a stone like the walls, and the walls are covered with cut figures, and every court is set around with pillars of white stone, very precisely fitted together. Near the corner where the labyrinth ends stands a pyramid 240 feet high, on which great figures are cut. A passage to this has been made underground. Unquote. Herodotus is drawing from multiple sources here, as well as his own first hand account. He speaks of the lower levels being out of bounds, but marvelled at the size and scale of the construction, as well as the quality of the engineering. He speaks of Lake Maurice being dug out by hand, which we shall cover later, and of the underground labyrinth, which held 3,000 chambers with a pyramid at one end. That is also mentioned by the historian Strabo four centuries later. Strabo was born to an affluent family from Amasia, within the borders of Pontus, which is in present-day Turkey, in around 64 BC. Here follows Strabo's reference regarding the labyrinth. Quote, there exists still in the gnome of Heracleopolis a labyrinth first built, it is said, 3,600 years ago by King Petruchus or Tithos. The walls were constructed of Perrine marble, while the columns of the other parts were of Sinite. This great mass is so solidly built that the lapse of time has been quite unable to destroy it, but it has been badly ravaged by the people of Heracleopolis, who have always detested it. To describe the whole of it in detail would be quite impossible, as it is divided up into regions and prefectures called gnomes. Thirty in number, with a great palace to each. In addition, it must contain temples of all the gods of Egypt and forty statues of Nemesis, in the same number of sacred shrines, as well as numerous pyramids. Banquet halls reached by steep ascents, Flights of 90 steps leading down from the porticos. Porphyritic columns, figures of gods and hideous monsters, and statues of kings. Some of the palaces are made so that the opening of the door makes a terrifying sound as of thunder. Most of the buildings are in total darkness. Outside the labyrinth there is a great heap of buildings called the Pterion under which are passages leading to other subterranean places, which we shall visit later." Unquote. Interesting to note that Strabo being the only other person I'm aware of besides Herodotus to have physically visited the underground complex and to have spoken to the priests gives a differing account of the person who constructed the labyrinth. Perhaps if these interactions indeed happened, then the passage of time from Herodotus to Strabo around 500 years may have seen changes in the historical traditions of the priesthood. In 1888, Professor Flinders Petrie rediscovered the site of the Egyptian labyrinth at Hawara. Petrie was a well-established authority on archaeology, even involved with the resurrection of Stonehenge in Wiltshire, Great Britain. Petrie 
believed he had found enough of the original foundations had remained to enable the size and orientation of the building to be roughly determined. The labyrinth was about 304 metres long and 244 metres wide. In other words, it was large enough to hold the great temples of Karnak and Luxor. Petrie indeed claimed he had discovered the foundations of the labyrinth, when in fact it was the roof as described by Herodotus, Theodorus Siculus and Strabo. Here follows a number of the quotes from these historians in regards to the building. Herodotus, 5th century BC The roof is of stone, like the walls, which we mentioned before. Theodorus Siculus, 1st century BC This building had a roof made of a single stone. Strabo, Geography Book 17 The wonder of it is the roofs of each chambers. They are made of a single stone. Unquote. Could it be the large stone base identified by Petrie could be a giant vaulted roof composed of a single slab of stone? Pliny the Elder, in his Natural History book, also describes the labyrinth as quote, a bewildering maze of paths, unquote, adding that not only individuals who entered the temple have to navigate through a confusing array of ramps and porticos, rooms and stairs, but they were also confronted with a fearful noise of thunder and had to pass through the chambers in total darkness. Herodotus also claims the age of the labyrinth to be far older than him, though no records have ever been put forward of its actual construction. The engineering and construction of such an enormous project could go back to the golden age of Zeptepe, to which was a time when Egypt was still ruled by the gods, a monument such as the pyramids are theorised to have been built. The ancient Greek philosopher Plato also attributed to the popularisation of Egypt in his writings. He told about the connection of the mysterious priests of the pharaohs with the mythological civilization of Atlantis. More recent attempts to discover the lost labyrinth have been made. The archaeological survey from around February-March 2008 after receiving permission from the Supreme Council of Antiquities of Egypt, headed up by the then Dr. Zahi Hawass, who we shall come back to later. A team of geo-radar specialists from the National Research Institute of Astronomy and Geography, or NRIAG, conducted extensive testing in the area identified by Flinders Petrie more than a century earlier. What the surveys revealed was pretty informative. The scanned area showed indication of a vast number of chambers and walls, several metres thick, below a huge stone slab at a depth of 8 to 12 metres. They found a grid structure of gigantic size, made of very high resistivity material, such as igneous rock or granite. The geophysics research confirmed the presence of archaeological features consistent with the description of the lost labyrinth of Egypt and confirmed Petrie's earlier archaeological work. The findings of this expedition called the Mataha Expedition were published in the fall of 2008 scientific journal of the NRIAG and the results were exchanged in a public lecture at Ghent University in October of 2008 in the presence of the Belgian press. However, it was not long after that the Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities in Egypt put a stop to all communications of the findings due, supposedly, to Egyptian national security. Louis de Cordier, the lead researcher on the expedition, waited two years for the Supreme Council to make the findings public, but by June 2010 it became clear that they had no desire to do so. Thus, the Cordier launched his own website, Labyrinth of Egypt, in order to publicly post the results of this significant research project. The water table has risen in the area due to damming of the Nile, causing the water from the seasonal flooding to inundate the area of the labyrinth. 
All we can do is hope excavations can be launched in the future in order to save and fully explore this ancient wonder. Moving northwards now and leaving Hawara behind, we come to Giza, another place with mentioned underground tunnels and construction. A researcher and author named Andrew Collins discovered an underground tunnel entrance to what appeared to be a cave system he dubbed Tomb of the Birds. He made the discovery back in 2009 whilst trying to establish his theory that the Giza pyramid lined up with the Cygnus constellation as opposed to rivaling notions at the time from other researchers such as John Anthony West, may he rest in peace, and Robert Bouval who believed the pyramids were built on the Leo and Orion constellations. Andrew managed to find what he believed to be a marker on the ground, which was a mastaba or early form of Egyptian pyramid one could say. After going through an old Giza survey map produced by Perring back in the 19th century, he later, while sponsored and funded by the Edgar Casey Foundation and with permission from the Egyptian antiquities, went on to discover slash rediscover and filmed the entrance to an underground cave system and proceeded to investigate inside. The cave was full of mummified birds and other small creatures, which he believes was due to a cult venerating Cygnus due to this bird correlation. Andrew, accompanied by his wife, only went so far down the tunnel and decided to go back. Having made the discovery with inadequate equipment, they returned a couple of times more, each time going back and discovering further inside the vaults, finding rectangular cut niches in the wall, as well as an abundance of red ochre. Each time they returned, he pushed further into the catacomb. After exploring and moving through chambers at a depth of around 350 feet, they came to a knowledge passage dubbed the Tube, Andrew's wife claimed to hear a rustling sound coming from inside the narrow tube and with that and the team already having been experiencing a strange feeling, they elected not to go any further. One of the most intriguing aspects of this discovery was that the then head of the Egyptian antiquities, Dr. Zahi Hawass, after being notified by Andrew of his discovery, claimed he was aware of the cave and claimed this was nothing. Yet since Andrew notified Zahi Hawass and released his findings, the tunnel has been closed off to the public without further information or investigation. The Tomb of the Birds later featured in many publications and even on the History Channel in a documentary, where it was revealed two staircases just inside the entrance to the cave existed. Some sources have now claimed the previously mentioned narrow passage or tube went deeper than Andrew and his wife had gone, as they had claimed. Obviously Giza has plenty of underground tunnels and shafts, from caverns under the plateau to the Osiris shaft and tomb. But Gebel Ghibli, a mound or raised elevation at the south end of the plateau, means the southernmost, also meaning to fire, or as the natives told Andrew, the first place or the place of the beginning. The Egyptian creation story and the Nubians to the south start with water and a mound of earth, which I found interesting. The Egyptians also believed the souls of the dead had to battle their way through the twelve chambers of hell, overcoming demons and monsters, crossing over lakes of fire and finding their way past gates guarded by fire-breathing serpents which made me think of the passages from Herodotus speaking of the tombs of the twelve kings at the labyrinth. So here we have some references to the number twelve. The number twelve, as I say, may be significant as we started this investigation with the alleged twelve kings. Leonardo da Vinci in his painting of the Last Supper seemingly depicts the twelve constellations of the zodiac along with the twelve disciples and Jesus. The repetition of the number twelve with the zodiac constellations all over the world also and how each culture came to have calendars and cycles 
revolving around them and the equinoxes is a mysterious connection. The number 12 appears a lot in the Bible also, long believed to be the westernised version of allegorical references to the Emerald Tablets, some say. Examples follow. Revelation 21, 16, 17. The New Jerusalem, which is made in heaven and brought to the earth by God himself, contains twelve gates made of pearl, that are each manned by an angel, twelve thousand from each tribe of Israel, 144,000 in total, will receive salvation during the end times and great tribulation. That was Revelation 7. Solomon appointed 12 officers over Israel, and if anyone is aware of Santos Benucci's work, he and others believe Sol on man, Solomon is soul of man. Another example, the scripture's first recordings of Jesus' words occurs when he is 12 years old. Luke 2.42 The high priest's breastplate, also called the breastplate of decision, had 12 stones embedded into it. Each stone represented a tribe of Israel, some believing this to be the 12 constellations of the zodiac. Herodotus makes mention also of the place of the 12 kings on the lower level of the labyrinth, to which he was shown around seemingly in a group, almost like a tour for people, yet he was denied access by the priests and keepers of the labyrinth. As they claimed that the sepulchres of the 12 unified kings and repositories of the sacred crocodiles were housed on the lower level, the earliest recordings we have of the labyrinth come from Herodotus, with Plato arriving around 70 years later, whereupon he documents the fall of Atlantis. Could it be that the priests of the temple in the earliest of recordings by Herodotus were not willing to part with more sacred knowledge, perhaps of Atlantean origins of the labyrinth, as well as philosophical and spiritual knowledge? Interesting to note that Plato, who was a student of Socrates until his death, never visited the labyrinth for himself, after surely being aware of Herodotus's visit only a century earlier. I find it most intriguing that we have such an impressive construction that seems almost impossible to have been constructed several thousand years ago. The infamous labyrinth near Lake Maurice is around 70 miles south of Cairo. As so, I started to ponder perhaps there is a connection via underground tunnels between the labyrinth and the pyramids at Cairo. Upon further investigation, I may have found a link. To the Osiris shaft then, on the Giza plateau, there are those who believe this to be the tomb of the god Osiris, which is why they refer to it as the Osiris shaft. However, some sources claim it to be anything but a tomb, claiming it is a dimensional portal that only those that have the correct DNA can ever hope to open. It's hermetically sealed by some form of ancient process, these people claim. Located less than two hours southwest of Cairo, Fayum Oasis is undoubtedly one of the country's hidden treasures. Collected water sample tests from the Osiris tomb at Giza showed something I hadn't expected. The water report showed a high concentration of sodium, followed by chloride. The percentages displayed a sodium level which is higher than the fresh water of the Nile and lower than the salinity of the Mediterranean Sea to which the Nile flows into, which means the water that runs under the Giza plateau is essentially salt water. There might be a potential for inorganic salts in the rock walls which could have leached into the water, though chemists thought that unlikely due to the igneous rock that is in the area. When the Great Pyramid was first opened, incrustations of salt over an inch thick were found inside. While some of this salt is known to be natural exudation from the stones of the pyramid, chemical analysis has shown that some of the salt has a mineral content consistent with salt from the sea, the same as in the Osiris shaft. So where is this salt water coming from? Well, the only known salt water lake in Egypt is in fact Lake Maurice, which as said is around 50 miles southwest of Cairo. 
Lake Maurice is an ancient man-made lake in the northwest area of the Fayum Oasis. Here Herodotus discusses Lake Maurice, quote, Such is the labyrinth, and still more marvellous is Lake Maurice, on which it stands. This lake has a circumference of 450 miles, or 60 sconei, as much as the whole seaboard of Egypt. Its length is from north to south, the deepest part has a depth of 50 fathoms, that it has been dug out by man and made by man's hand, the lake shows for itself, for almost in the middle of it stands two pyramids, so built that 50 fathoms of each are above and 50 fathoms below the water, atop of each is a colossal stone figure seated on a throne. Thus these pyramids are a hundred fathoms high, and the hundred fathoms equal a furlong or six hundred feet, the fathom measuring six feet or four cubits. The water of the lake is not natural, for the country here is exceedingly arid, but brought by a channel from the Nile. Six months it flows into the lake, and six back into the river. From the six months that it flows out of the lake, the daily take of fish brings a silver talent into the royal treasury, and twenty minae for each day that it flows into the lake. Furthermore, the natives said that this lake drains underground into the Libyan citrus, and extends under the mountains that were above Memphis. Having the inland country on its west, when I could not see anywhere the earth taken from the digging of this lake, since this was curious to me, I asked those who lived nearest the lake where the stuff was that had been dug out. They told me where it had been carried, and I readily believed them, for I had heard of a similar thing happening in the Assyrian city of Ninus. Sardanopolis, king of Ninus, had great wealth, which he kept in an underground treasury. Some thieves plotted to carry it off, so they surveyed the land and dug a course underground from their own house to the palace, carrying the earth taken out of the passage dug by night to the Tigris River, which runs past Ninus, until at last they accomplished their end. This, I was told, had happened when the Egyptian lake was dug, except that the work went on by night. This, I was told, had happened when the Egyptian lake was dug, except that the work went on not by night, but by day. The Egyptians bore the earth dug out by them to the Nile, to be caught and scattered, as was to be expected by the river. Thus, this is how the lake is said to have been dug." Unquote. Is this salt water proof of an underground connection between Lake Maurice and the labyrinth of antiquity directly to the Giza Plateau? Perhaps the salt water found in the Osiris tomb is deposits from tunnels that was designed to run salt water from Lake Maurice to the Giza Plateau, and even potentially to provide water to flow underneath the pyramids. Unfortunately, I cannot give an answer on that, and we will just have to wait for more archaeological research to be done on these areas. But the ancient structure of the labyrinth and underground tunnel systems are there to be seen and do match the descriptions laid down by the historians of yesteryear. I understand people waited a while for this video and there was a lot of stuff I actually removed. Um, I actually put a lot of esoteric information into it re relating to the Emerald Tablets, you know, Amenti and the underground shafts that were supposed to have been blasted there and a lot of other nuance, new age stuff if you will so i tried to stay away from that i wanted to make this about the labyrinth about the fact that there's a number of physical references and people who visited the labyrinth we have the features on the ground there's excavations taking place and there's archaeological surveys taking place so as i say i just hope someday in the future the water table can be addressed uh be able to pump the water out of there at the moment it seems like 
it could be a case of that place, Oak Island over in America, you know, the Templar's treasure that they're never going to find. Because every time they pump water out, water comes in. So unless the water table situation is addressed and the Nile inundations is somehow curb and you're able to keep that water away from from the area then who knows maybe maybe the labyrinth will never be excavated fully which is a, a shame because as the historians have mentioned you've got tombs of 12 kings which again we will come on to that topic in another video and you've got pyramids on the ground you know the two massive pyramids that were supposed to be situated in Lake Maurice have mysteriously disappeared yet the two colossi statue that were supposed to be seated on top of these pyramids you can actually find there is two colossi statues that look very very ancient just sitting um, in the desert in Egypt and I'll put a photograph right now to sh show people the, the images I'm talking about and I can't help but cast my mind back and think with these once situated on top of those pyramids but who knows and like i say maybe the, the the underground passages led off to who knows where alas i will leave this video here i just felt it was necessary to try and connect some of the things i had pondered for some time and with that said thanks for stopping by don't forget to hit the like button and i'll catch you in the next video peace